Today we're going to look at force fields and test charges. Let's suppose we have some central charge capital Q here. Then of course that charge would create an electric field around it. And we might want to know the electric field at some point in space due to that charge capital Q. Well, of course the electric field would be equal to the force acting per unit charge which means we have to bring a charge to that point in order to figure out what the electric field is. So let's imagine bringing a charge to that point. Now that creates a little bit of a problem because, because electric charges create their own electric fields. So if you bring that charge to that point, it's going to change the electric field that was already there and you're not going to get the right answer. For that reason, we have to introduce the idea of a test charge. So a test charge is a charge that does not create a significant electric field of its own. Okay, what you're seeing in front of you is one diagram that represents a test charge and one diagram that is not a test charge. The blue lines are supposed to represent the electric field. So which one of those two would you say is a test charge and which one is not a test charge? Hopefully what you said is that this one here, it is a test charge because it's not affecting the electric field. This one here is having an effect on the electric field and therefore it is not a test charge. Now you might not know this about yourselves and you might have greater aspirations for yourself, but you would make an excellent test mass. We need test masses to measure gravitational fields in the same way that we need test charges to measure electric field. The way it would work is we'd get one of these big Newton scales and we'd hang it up. And then we'd put a big hook on it and we'd hang you from that hook and measure your weight. And let's say it came out to be 690 Newtons. Then we'd ask you, well, what's your mass? And you might say, 70 kilograms. So then we'd work out that gravitational field, the force per unit mass, 690 divided by 70, and we get that familiar value of 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So you make a great test mass because you don't create a significant gravitational field of your own. You're a much better test mass than, say, the moon. We bring the moon here, it changes the field we're trying to measure, doesn't work well at all. So congratulations, you're an excellent test mass. Now officially, a test charge is any infinitely small charge. But what I like to imagine in my mind, I imagine a totally passive, positive one Coulomb charge. Now a one Coulomb charge is huge, it creates a large electric field of its own, so I have to specify that it's passive, that it, for some reason, just a theoretical idea, doesn't create any electric field of its own. And the reason I like to do that is that the electric field is, of course, the force per unit charge. But my test charge is going to be one coulomb. And that means that the value of the electric field will be equal in value to the force. Those are going to have the same size. So if I know how to use Coulomb's law and calculate the force, then equally I know how to calculate the electric field. They're going to have exactly the same value. The only difference is my units for electric field are newtons per coulomb. My units for force are newtons. And of course because it's a positive one coulomb charge, the direction's the same as well. So we're going to have the same magnitude for electric field and electric force and the same direction. They're the same vector. The only difference is going to be in the units. Quick IB question based on the definition of the electric field strength. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. First of all, you can eliminate these two with work done. That turns out to be about electric potential and we're going to study that next. The electric field strength has to do the force per unit charge. Now this answer A here looks pretty close to what I talked about, what I, had, what I said I imagined in my mind, but they don't mention the word passive here. And if they don't mention the word passive, it's not correct. The correct answer is B, the force per unit charge acting on a small test charge 
and by making it small you're saying it's making a insignificant electric field of its own. So the correct answer here is B. What you're often asked to do in IB questions is to qualitatively compare electric fields from several point charges. So you have to take a few factors into account. The first thing you have to realize is about the direction. And of course the, the field always points away from a positive charge and the field points towards a negative charge. Second thing you have to consider the magnitude. First thing there that you need to consider is that bigger charges produce proportionally bigger fields. But you also have to consider the distance because in Coulomb's law the distance gets squared. That distance factor is going to be more important than the charge factor. So the field is weaker if farther from charge. And in fact it's going to go as 1 over that distance squared. Let's make up an example and go over the reasoning process. So let's suppose that we've got a positive 1 Coulomb charge located here and over here say a negative 2 Coulomb charge. We're going to evaluate the electric field say up here such that we'll make this distance 1 meter and the distance from the 2 Coulomb charge to the point in question is going to be 2 meters. So what we need to do is to evaluate the contribution to the electric field from each one of these charges separately. So we'll look at the 1 Coulomb charge first and see what contribution it makes just using Coulomb's law. And we use Coulomb's law by imagining that we're bringing a positive 1 Coulomb charge, test charge, to that point. So that 1 Coulomb charge is going to push away the positive 1 Coulomb test charge and you're going to get a force, an electric field, in this direction. So that E1 would be equal to the Coulomb's law force between two 1 Coulomb charges the 1 Coulomb charge here and that 1 Coulomb test charge. So that would be equal to K times 1 Coulomb times a second 1 Coulomb all over a distance of 1 meter that gets squared. So you're just going to get an E1 with a magnitude equal to Coulomb's constant. Then we apply exactly the same reasoning to the 2 Coulomb charge. Of course it's a negative so it attracts that positive the positive test charge. This should not be as long. E2 should be a shorter vector, a shorter field vector than E1. And that's because even though it's got twice as much charge, it's twice as far away. And the distance is more important than the charge because it goes as 1 over the distance squared. So E2 will equal Coulomb's constant times 2 Coulombs times 1 Coulomb for the test charge divided by a distance of 2 meters squared. So we're just going to get K over 2. So if I look at the ratio E1 over E2 I'm just going to get K divided by K over 2 which is simply 2. In other words E1 should be twice as long as E2 which is approximately as I've drawn it. E1's about twice as long as E2. Now the IB might ask you, well, what direction will the resultant field point? So we've got a rough scale diagram for E1 and E2. We can just complete a parallelogram to add those vectors and find the resultant. Our resultant is just going to be the diagonal of that parallelogram. In other words, this here would represent the resultant electric field. So the IB would like you to be able to qualitatively predict in what direction an electric field will lie due to several charge contributions. If you understood that, you should be able to do this IB multiple choice question. So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video, read over the question, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. So we've got three positive charges. I'll call them QX, QZ, and QY. They're all the same size and they're all positive. So they're all going to push away. If I place a positive test charge here, QX is going to push this way. So I'll call that e, the EX contribution. 
QY is going to push this way. And you'll notice here that EX and EY, they're equal and opposite. They're going to cancel each other out. And that means that the only contribution to the electric field is going to be from QZ here. And it's going to push the positive test charge away in this direction. And that would be EZ, but EZ is going to be exactly equal to the resultant electric field. And so the correct answer here is B. The electric field is going to be directly away from the charge at Z. Here's another very similar IB multiple choice question. Once again, I'd like you to pause the video, read it over, try it out for yourself, and come back for the answer. Hopefully, you said that the correct answer would be A, because the if we have three equal charges, the positive charges are each going to push away the positive test charge. And so we'd get three electric fields in directions like so. And then, of course, if we add those three vectors up, we're going to get zero. And that means that the electric field at P is going to have to be zero. So the correct answer here is A. And finally, I wanted to do one numerical example with you. The IB seldom asks this type of question. However, I find for a lot of students, they don't really get it until they start punching the numbers in. So let's try that. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video, read over the question, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. So let's place our 1 Coulomb charge right here, positive 1 Coulomb charge right here. It's going to be attracted to the negative charge up at the top, so there'll be a force F1 due to Q1. There will also be a force pushing to the left because of the repulsion from this positive charge Q2. So we'll have another force F2. And then, of course, to find the resultant force, we've just got to add those two forces so that we'll have a vector F1 up and a vector F2 across. And our resultant is going to be like so. So let's find out the magnitude of F1. All we have to do is plug into Coulomb's law. So K is 9 times 10 to the 9th. Our first charge was negative 5 nanocoulombs. We're just interested in the magnitude, so I'm not worried about that negative sign. The negative sign can be used, but it, all it tells you is whether or not you have an attractive or repulsive force, and we already know that anyways. So 5 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, and then our other charge is the 1 coulomb charge that we're placing down here. The separation between those two charges is 7 centimeters, or 0 0.07 meters. Don't forget to switch to SI units. Multiply that out and you should get an answer of about 9200 newtons. And then we can do the same thing for F2. Still the same K value. This time our charge is 6 nanocoulombs or 6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Once again it's against that 1 coulomb charge and the distance of separation this time 6 centimeters. Square that you should get an answer of about 15,000 newtons there. So now we know the length of these vectors here. This is going to be 9200, and this vector has a length of 15,000. So if I want to find out the magnitude of the resultant force, I just use Pythagorean theorem. It'll be 15,000 squared plus 9200 squared, and you get an answer there of approximately 18,000 newtons. So all that remains now is to find our angle of orientation, our polar angle. And that's going to equal the inverse tan of the y component divided by the x component. Our y component, 9200. x component, 15,000, but that's to the left, so that's really a negative 15,000. And you want to notice our x value is negative. And when our x value is negative, we have to add 180 degrees to the answer given by our calculator. If you do that, you should get an answer to two significant digits of 150 degrees. So that means we've worked out our force. It's 18,000 newtons at 150 degrees. Now we need to work out the magnitude and the direction of the electric field. But that's going to be very, very easy because the electric field let's take its magnitude first, has to equal the force per unit charge. However, the charge we're talking about here is P. 
plus 1 coulomb. So we're just dividing by 1 there. And that means our electric field is going to have the same value, 18,000 newtons. But it'll be 18,000 newtons per coulomb now as an electric field. And of course the electric field and the force on a positive charge are always in the same direction. That means our angle of orientation has to be the same as well. So that's going to be 150 degrees. So our electric field is 18,000 newtons per coulomb at 150 degrees. So in summary, electric field is the force per unit charge acting on a positive test charge. A test charge is a small charge that does not create a significant field. And then it's very handy to think of the field as the force acting on a passive positive 1 coulomb charge. And finally, if we want to do estimates for resultant fields, those resultant fields are simply the vector sum of the fields to the individual point charges. So when you're making the estimates of those individual electric fields, consider the distance from the point to the charge and consider the size of the charge itself. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.